Are you an adventurer looking to take your hunt to the next level? Then you're in the right place. Welcome to East Meets West Hunt with your host, Bo Martonic. Hey everyone, we have a really exciting podcast coming up here today. And this one was one that we recorded back in November during the rut in the Edmonton Bow Zone at the Classic Outfitters Lodge in Alberta. And couldn't release this one for a reason. And the reason is, is we're going to be talking about the 2019 Whitetail launch and some redesigned gear and some new gear that's coming out from, from Sika Gear. And got to use this stuff in some ridiculous conditions in Alberta as well as Pennsylvania afterwards and put this stuff really through the, the ringer. So I'm I'm excited to get this information out to you. The science behind it is, you know, as we talk here with Chris Derrick and Eric Gilmore, Adam Jordison, Jim Holt Jr. and the whole crew there and how these products came to be the whole background behind them it's just a it's a really exciting podcast and kind of an inside look and how sick comes up with these products and how they test them so for me it was just a really neat experience to be able to to kind of be put right in that that whole i guess atmosphere there and and see again how they're testing it how they're coming up with these ideas what kind of measures they're going through to make sure that the gear that they're putting out is specific to the needs of the the whitetail hunter and and specifically some of this gear with the cold weather and also some redesigned Um, base layers and some other things there but i won't get too much into what that new gear is as we'll cover that in great detail on the podcast here but also when we were up there i I don't think i've talked about it up to this point but we did record a film um all about jim jim hold jr and you know his family with the outfit up there classic outfitters which is infamous in the bow zone i mean you can basically credit him for putting the bow zone on the map. And that film was awesome. The, the, the fact was I actually got to be a part of it and was, wasn't expecting it, but I'm, I'm really excited to see how that film is going to turn out. And I believe that's slated to release sometime in the late summer of 2019, if I'm not mistaken. Um, not going to go into a whole lot of detail. I don't know what I'm allowed to talk about with that. So I'm going to keep that kind of a little bit under wraps, but it's going to be a, a pretty awesome film. And so looking forward to that going forward, as far as any other news. Uh, so 2019 is here now and which means a whole new scouting season for big woods, mountain bucks, and even, and then getting ready for some Western hunts, some hunts coming up here in 2019, looking at where I'm going to be elk hunting at using, you know, on X maps, a scout go hunt to ch- pick out the state and units I'm looking towards and don't have that all set in stone yet, but have some pretty good ideas of what I'm going to do. And it's, it's looking like it's going to be a pretty banner year. So with that being said, the ATA show is coming up this week, and that's the reason for releasing this podcast right now is you guys are going to get a first listen before anywhere else on what this new gear is and everything behind it before it gets released to the rest of the public and and uh, the rest of the media groups, I guess it would be, at the ATA show. So. If you're not familiar with the ATA show, it's the Archery Trade Association show and where all the new products are released, retailers go to check it out, figure out what they're going to buy for their shops or their online stores or whatever it may be. And this will be my third year going and the, I went the last couple of years when I was working for Bucks and Bows and got to see the whole retailer side, but this is the first time that I'll be there through 
you know, East meets West and the, the media side of things. So if there's anything specific you think that you'd like me to check out and, you know, maybe give some feedback on, shoot me a message, uh, comment on the Instagram, Facebook posts, uh, let me know and I'll take a look at it. We'll be recording a few podcasts while we're out there with some different people and companies some products trying to cover a whole bunch of stuff that, you know, may be helpful for, for the whole EMW community here. So really looking forward to that heading out to Louisville, making the drive here on Thursday morning and be there through Saturday afternoon. And, and as far as any other news goes, uh, the new apparel that's come out. So the East meets West apparel has gotten a lot of really good feedback. I'm pumped on the designs, uh, the, the new hats that came out that I had designed myself and use legacy caps here out of Pennsylvania to design the woodsman adventure hats and also redesign the Appalachia caps. So that's, those are some pretty cool products. Check them out. They're all in stock right now on the website. Check those out. If you uh, want to help support the podcast and, and uh, help this thing keep growing and, and going in the next direction to, to really be able to, to serve you guys and girls and, and make sure that we're pro- providing uh, good content out there. There's also a couple new articles up uh, online. So check those out at uh, the online journal and see what you think and what you want more of. And I, I know that, that I promised some gear related articles that I'm working on. So I'm pumped to get those going and really get that information out there. And, and again, did anybody has any feedback or anything specific they think I should check out or want me to talk about, let me know. And I'm open to, to listening and, and seeing what goes on from there. So with that being said, I'm not going to keep rambling on here any longer. Let's get right into the podcast here from Edmonton, Alberta, in the Bow Zone, 2019 Sick of Gear. Thanks, guys. All right, we're back at the lodge here in outside of Edmonton, Alberta, the Classic Outfitters Lodge, and I'm sitting here with... Chris Derrick, Eric Gilmore, and Jim Hole Jr. Guys, how's uh, how's everyone doing tonight? We're we're doing well. I'm great. Good, Bo. Good, Bo. Good. Good to have you back on here, Jim. But before we uh, get rolling here, I want to kind of introduce everyone and go around the room and kind of talk about uh, what what we're doing here for this. Besides hunting big whitetails, so Chris, why don't you get started here? Yeah, I'm uh, Chris Derrick, and uh, I'm the Whitetail Product Manager for Sitka. So we break our our lines out by, like, big game, waterfowl, um, and whitetail is obviously the other hunt category. And uh, so we really make sure that all of the product that we develop for whitetail is fit for use for the type of hunting we do. We won't just take waterfowl gear slap another camo pattern on it and then say it's good for whitetail. So everything I, I spend my time around is is creating product that's specifically used for whitetail hunting and that's it. And then um, I work with Eric who makes all my dreams come true. <laughs> my name, yeah, I'm Eric Gilmore. I work with Chris. I work with all the other product managers at Sitka. Um, I don't work on every project with Chris or those product managers, but I was fortunate enough to be on this project and mm-hmm. it's been a great uh, experience working again with the fanatic. Uh, it's my second time with the fanatic and I think we've done a great job um, bringing it to where it is today with the help of some great people. Yeah. So Eric, real quick, as far as like a product developer, what kind of, can you kind of explain oh, what you do there? Sorry. Um, so Chris and our other product managers will come up with an idea, maybe coming from, you know, working with Jim or another, you know, awesome hunter. And they're like, we got to do this. We got to make this. And we have designers and developers. Designers will kind of draw a pretty picture based on his um, concept. And then we take that picture and go, okay, let's make it. And we figure out, you know, textiles, zippers, insulation, fit, you know, all the way from, you know, p- picture to production. 
uh, how to get something built and get it, um, like Chris used the term, fit for use. Fit for use as far as um, in the field, fit for use for uh, how it fits you, and so forth and so on. Okay, so yeah, like like Chris was saying, so he comes up with some crazy idea or him and his team and says, Eric, figure it out. Mm -hmm. Is that kind of how that works? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, and it's not just me. We have a, we have a few other developers that work at Sitka who uh, we... Uh, work together on fit, on fa fabrics, on trims, and it's, it's really a team effort in how we get things done. Awesome. Yeah, and, and the listeners have heard we've talked to John Barclow in the past, which is Chris's counterpart across the table, you know, over in the, the big game side of things. So um, let's, uh, let's move on here to Jim. Jim, you don't need a whole lot of introduction, but you want to introduce yourself again here well thanks Bo. i'm i'm jim hole jr i'm a uh, uh outfitter in edmonton's bozone alberta have been for uh, 30 some years and i have the opportunity to work with the sitka crew as a whitetail athlete and also working on some product development as well and uh that's what's exciting for us is to be involved with the development of the, of the new fanatic uh products it's great stuff yeah so kind of what you guys have uh, alluded to here, so Eric and Jim, we're going to be talking about the launch here of the new Fanatic system, which is comprised of a pack, vest, jacket, and bibs, if I'm correct. Right, Chris? Yep, and it goes along with the Fanatic hoodie as well. Um, but really where this started is is we had a concept, you know, we had a product that's been out there for a while that's the Fanatic. and. And one of the things we always tried to do is figure out ways to make things better. So um, really, the Fanatic's designed for really cold weather conditions. Uh, ultimately, that's why we're here uh, with Jim and the Bozone. One of the great opportunities about coming to Jim's place is probably we try and go to the extremes. And what's really cool about this place is not only can you get really cold weather hunting fairly early into November, which allows you to, to go through and start testing products earlier. Um, it's also one of the most challenging hunting environments out there. It's exceptionally quiet here. And, and I've always like people talk about you've had still days in the woods, but this one's one of those ones where you can almost hear your own heartbeat um, when you're sitting in the stand and it's that quiet. And so that was really what we were trying to do is, is figure out ways to make a really good product that's already out there better and what better proving grounds to come in when, when you've gone through some of the early developments. Uh, we spend a lot of time field testing, so we won't just bring stuff out into the field. I won't just create a product and then not actually go out there and experience myself and then also not have it go on to a bunch of other field testers to give me feedback. So this really started last year. We were going through uh, what we wanted to do with the product. I was talking with Jim uh, in the summertime, actually, and, and we were discussing what we wanted to, to make changes to the product. And then, um, and then last year we were to able to come here and uh, actually put some of the gear to test uh, and also continue how to refine it and make it better than because, you know, sometimes when we start off with stuff, you know, you'll get it and it's it's a train wreck and, and, you know, you'll turn around and try and fix that. I mean, one of the things we were doing here last year is we were looking for ways to make even zippers quieter. So we had a bunch of product with a bunch of different zippers on them uh, and you wouldn't think that would be that big of a deal. But, yeah, it made it really hard to layer with yeah. some of the zippers that we had. <clears throat> yeah, and you, and you definitely have – so you have – Coming up here to the bow zone, you have, again, the cold weather, you have the extremely silent, silent conditions, and you have probably one of the best guys to give you criticism out there as far as whether the product's going to work or not with Jim over here. Jim has an opinion. Well, you're right, Bo. I'm, I am happy to criticize, so I can give you that one. But no, it's been great for me and, and, and my crew up here as end users to be very critical on the gear. I mean... As Chris had already touched on, there was a good system up and working, and, and we were in our element, and we were getting the job done with the with the previous gear. It's, there was a lot of development to go into that, but my respects to the guys at Sitka that pushed and pushed and pushed uh, to further improve the product and with our input, and it's it's really exciting for us because the product that we have now is, it just went up, 
it didn't go up a notch. It went up a few notches. It went from good to first class. I mean, this, this stuff's phenomenal, the new gear. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm really excited about it. And so, Chris, uh, one of the big things that that you were touching on and have done a lot of studies with some of the other guys at, you know, at Sitka had been, how do you measure sound? And you were going through showing us some of the slides last night of everything. And it was a very, you know, extensive study. Can you kind of go into explaining that a little bit? Yeah. So what we were trying to do is uh, we're Sitka for people that don't know is actually owned by Gore or the company that owns Gore-Tex. Um, and one of the the assets that we have that no other company has is we have what's called the, the Gore Comfort Lab. And so what we can do is, is there's, there's like a rain, there's two rain rooms in there. There's a comfort chamber, uh, where, you know, we can make that thing go down to negative 50 degrees Celsius, you know, and, and, and turn on wind. And, you know, these, these are really cool lab environments. Um, so one of the approaches that we did is we started partnering with our, with our team members at Gore on ad- analyzing the ways that we could make uh, the textile package that we were using um, significantly quieter. So we, we developed what's called the, the Gore noise analyzer, and it's basically a machine that moves the fabrics around, and there's two types of sounds that typically garments make. Buckle, uh, which is the crinkling sound that you'll hear if you take a rain jacket, you'll hear the popping noise. And then that happens at about 125 hertz. And then there is what's called rustle. If you brush your hand on your, on your jacket, the sound of like the material rubbing against your hand is called rustle. And that typically happens at about 3,000 um, hertz. And so what we would do is we'd be able to put this into an isolated sound chamber. We'd be able to move it around in a really controlled environment, always makes the same motion, always at the same pressure. And then there's a microphone in there and a computer program that analyzes that and measures what the sound is. So by doing that, we could take a bunch of different textile that we wanted to take a look at. We were developing in, in different ways of structuring the wind stopper that we were using in this garment. And, um, and be able to narrow that down. So rather than building like two or three jackets, though it takes a long time to do, we could take like 50 different options and throw them in there and basically narrow them down. Mm-hmm. And then we were also to be able to go into the uh, comfort lab and figure out different warmth options. So for example, using that machine, we could take at different types of Prima Loft insulation and ways to make the garment quieter just by even changing the type of insulation we're using. Um, so that's the step one. That's a controlled lab environment. Step two of that is then we want to take those into simulated real world conditions. So that's where we go into that comfort chamber. That I remember uh, that I mentioned, um, and in there we we put a a quiet room or what's called an anechoic chamber. Um, that's it's basically a noise canceling room, and we lowered the temperature down to negative um, uh, four degrees. Uh, and uh, which is about negative 20 degrees Celsius. And we simulated different types of motions you would do in type in uh, when you're in engagement distances with deer. So that's, um, it, you know, typically within 80 yards, mm-hmm. usually within 40 yards, there's a motion where you might um, reach into your range finder pocket to, to range a deer, or you might be moving your binos. So that's going to simulate a gear to gear interaction. Um, there might be, uh, when you're drawing your bow, that's a motion you're obviously going to do usually within 40 yards. And then also there's, when you turn, sometimes you brush against the tree. And so what we did is we simulated those different types of movements and we measured the sound. And then the last part that we did to that was brought in experts. So the way Optifade was developed, we partnered with people that understand vision, camo patterns, and how animals see. Well, in this way, what we did is we partnered with a, a gentleman named Dr. Carl Miller, who's a distinguished professor of deer management at University of Georgia, and then another guy named James Black, who's an acoustical engineer. He knows what sound does in different types of environments, and we, we were basic. We were we we were able to bring them into that uh, lab. They were able to look at the results and basically help us understand not how we perceived 
uh, the sound, but how deer will be able to per, uh, perceive that sound and then what it might do in an outdoor environment. Uh, so when you're moving, um, ultimately we can, we can determine what's actually going to happen. And what we found out is with all of this, the, it's a kind of a long story to get there, but we were able to half the audible engagement distance. So what that means is if you made a, a movement in the old gena- the old fanatic jacket, for example, if you were drawing your bow mm-hmm. and a deer could hear that movement at 40 yards in the old jacket and the new jacket, they would have to be within 20 yards to hear that. Okay. For example. So, okay. So by, by changing up the, the different textiles or I guess, is it, it was not just the outer face. It was a lot of different things from the insulation through the, through, um, excuse me, the, the outer, the Berber, the, the, any, everything there was what allowed you to be able to reduce the sound by that much yeah, the engagement was, distances, I guess. Yeah. So there's a lot that went into that. Um, yeah. So we used to use uh Primaloft silver, uh, that was, uh, in this. Now we're using, uh, what's called Primaloft silver, ultra high loft, which is a V-lap. It's a lot more of a supple insulation. It's a little bit more breathable. Um, another thing we did also with the Berber too, which is a big uh, difference is it's actually not a print. It's a sliver knit. So each, uh, it, rather than actually being printed. So the old Fanatic, for example, looked kind of washed out. It was kind of a muted colors. And with the new one, each thread basically that comes up in that knit is its own color. So they're actually not printed. Each fiber that's coming up in that Berber is actually, there's a black fiber. There's that, you know, whitish fiber. There's a brown one. And um, so that's, there's, it's, there's a lot better uh, optifade print clarity as well. Yeah. So as that Berber kind of wears and, and, you know, things are brushed against it, you're not losing that quality yep. and the actual, you know, the science of optifade, I guess, you yep. know, within that. Okay. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, so that's, those, those are, I mean, there's a lot more that went into it, but that's really in a nutshell, what the science of sound is, is is we, we really spent a long time trying to go through and and make sure that we were developing the best product and reducing the sound, um, while still making that fit for use. We still wanted to make it where you could pack it into a, into a, um, you know, a pack and ultimately, you know, that was from talking to Jim, uh, because when we were coming, when we were coming here, it's, this is something you can't really understand until you come here, I feel like. Um, but we really wanted to make the ultimate, uh, quiet garment that we could for this environment. Cause if it works for here, I promise it's going to work for everywhere else. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's, definitely true jim do you have anything to add to that as far as with some of these new improvements yeah absolutely i I don't think chris could be any more right in terms of the the proving ground this this northern latitude is the quietest place you're gonna you're gonna get to in terms of the cold weather hunting there's it's colder there's less foliage it's just uh, the sound travels further um there's just no question and as far as the gear i mean We've been pushing hard to have the quietest gear that we can possibly have, and and the improvements. Like I said, the previous gear was good. The new gear is great for the simple fact that, as Chris had touched on, the distance has been cut in, been cut in half in terms of from a predator standpoint. You can be that much closer. That's what yeah. we're concerned. Of course, we're concerned with rather. We're, of course, we're interested in the science, but more so, we're interested in what it does for us from a uh, from a bow hunting standpoint in, in close bow hunting. Yeah. Um, the, the, the garments are just, just fantastic. And, and, uh, as well as the pack that we're excited about as well, the fanatic pack, it's a lot of time went into that and a lot of hard work went into that. And it's just a, a wonderful product that makes the system, the overall system, just what, what's needed for the all mesh together. Yeah, absolutely. It's yep. a combination. It's a combination of pieces that, that it's just very polished and that's what, what we're excited about. Okay. So, um, Eric, when, as far as when you're going through here, so Chris, again, is coming up, going through some of these different tests and thinking about what you need to do. Is that something that you would do next is like, all right, I get to reach out to say your suppliers or someone else to try to come up with what's the best fit for insulation. Is that kind of some of the stuff that you're doing? Yeah, I think we have, um, I mean, I work 
with Chris, and we have a, a, a fabric developer to come up with the, the textile. Mm -hmm. um, it's a different, like Chris alluded to, it's called a sliver knit. So it's a different, totally different knit construction than the old Berber. The other thing that's not laminated, like, so the outer shell of this fabric is just the fabric itself, um, where we put the lamination on the inside, and then the insulation, the V-lap, all those together, like the, you know, we played around with multiple different insulations, multiple different, I, I, I don't know how many different Berbers we tried, or other textiles we tried, other linings we tried, but yeah, that was between me and Chris and our fabric developer, we all worked together to kind of like, what what are the things we think are going to be quiet? What are the things we think are going to not be quiet and try to rule them out before we even test them? Um, so yeah, the, part of that was, you know, just my involvement and um, I can't think of anything else to add to that. Okay. Perfect. That's that's exactly what I was kind of looking for. And and talking about, you know, the bow zone as far as proving grounds here, that's what the first the first uh, night, Chris was like, here, wear the old Fanatic stuff out before you get into the new stuff and just see how it works, you know. And, and I always thought the old Fanatic was quiet, you know. I never thought anything of it. And so, but I really paid attention, and up here you can definitely pay attention as far as sound goes. So I, I know the science says it cuts the distance in half, but I think in reality it feels like it cuts it even further. Like it feels yeah. like the stuff against trees, against your own hand motion, your own arm motion. I can barely hear it myself, and I'm yeah. right there. So it's like, it's that's, that's it's the biggest thing I've crazy. noticed was like when you rub up against a tree, like just even like when you're leaning against it and go like this, just the smallest movement before. Yeah. Here, you could definitely hear a little bit of a, a sound. Not Again, it's not something that's a screeching noise, but it was something noticeable. Yeah. With with the new textile and the new Fanatic gear, it's like you don't really hear that. And also, and again, those different motions you're talking about, drawing a bow, reaching into a rangefinder pocket, doing just about anything you know in, in the tree is a lot quieter with that. Even sliding on... Um, like when you're leaning up against the tree, just anything like that would be, uh, seems yeah, to be the, a lot quieter. Even just putting it on first thing in the morning, you know, when it's cold and you put that thing on, it makes no noise. Like you're sliding your arms through the sleeves and there's like, it's just, it's quiet. Yeah. So now that we kind of talked about, you know, the, the science of sound and everything that went into it from that side of things. So what are some of the new features and everything that you can look for? Let's start in the, the fanatic jacket and bib system before we get into the pack stuff. Okay. So, um, on the jacket, there was a couple of things, uh, I had, I had survey. We have about 50 ambassadors that are specific whitetail ambassadors. So there's not only, uh, guys like Jim uh, and and women that are on the team as well. But there's people on our team that are giving feedback on this product. Well, I sent out a survey basically that, that said, give me the good, the bad, and the ugly. So tell me what you like uh, about the products out there, what you are just so-so about, and what do we need to fix right away. Um, and obviously the sound thing came up, um, you know, when we were doing the feedback, but then some of the people were complaining about what was on the old Fanatic, like on the chest, the the uh, grunt tube holder, they perceived it being in the way, or they didn't like to have all that on their chest. Um, so we redesigned uh, the rangefinder pocket now has a grunt tube holder inside of it because there's people that actually just love that feature, having to be able to store your grunt tube right on your chest. You can reach down there and you can grunt. You can drop your rangefinder into your pocket. I'm um, one of those guys. Yeah. I love that. I love yeah. that feature on there. Yeah, and so we wanted to maintain that, um, but I wanted to get it out of the way uh, for people that didn't didn't like that. Um, another thing we did is you're going to see there's actually a really unique design on this. So if you look down, if you're a right-handed shooter uh, and you're shooting a bow, the left sleeve has no Berber on the inside, and that's basically for bowstring clearance. So we want to make sure that there's no way that Berber is going to get in the way of your bowstring, uh, because, you know, even though we make a very sleek package, there's still more bulk than if you were just shooting like in your standard shirt. So we would make sure we minimize that bulk on the inside. And then if you look on the right hand sleeve or your draw sleeve, or if you're shooting a muzzle loader, um, 
there's no Berber that's actually in the inner elbow. And that's actually for compression as well. And there's reduced bulk in your elbow. So we really map that. And there's actually what's called the lefty. So we flipped everything and there's uh, a left-handed version. So now we have the first left-handed jacket on the marketplace. <laughs> so, um, and I know that's going to make a lot of people happy because there's probably about 10% to 12% of archers are lefties. Uh, they may not even be left-handed. They just may be left-eye dominant. Mm -hmm. um, and then they're going to shoot uh, with a different hand. So we want to make sure that's right for them. We opened up the neck collar a little bit for uh, stacking. Uh, there's no, there's burr resistant material on the hem. That's an area that picks up burrs. Yep. Sometimes, and then what I'm most excited about and the feature that I've been really excited about on both the jacket and the vest is the constant connect safety harness port. So typically when you would add a layer in a jacket and we had a harness port in the back, technically what you need to do in order to stay connected to the tree is you need to flip your lineman's rope back around the tree, lock it in, and then disconnect your safety harness strap, go through the port, reconnect it, take all your linemen's off to stay connected to the tree the whole time. The new system, when you hook it up and you're, you can now add or take off a jacket without ever disconnecting and having to go through all that mess. Um, so it makes layering very easy. You can throw on a jacket, the collar breaks apart in the back. It's a, like a slide to snap, a lock snap in the back with some magnets. And basically your collar is just going to break apart in the back, can go over your safety harness tether and then you can take on or off your jacket without di disconnecting from the tree stand. Yeah. And that's something then we filed a patent for as well. Yeah. That's something that's very simple to use too. So uh, you were talking about how you're like, I can, you know, I can do it in the, you know, without even looking now, just putting it behind. So I tried it this, this evening and it's, it's pretty simple to be able to hook up. Amazing. So then if you throw your jacket on, you don't forget to put your safety harness port. You're not going, taking it off again and doing that. You just unsnap it. Pull it, push it through, put it back together, and it's. And when I say snap it, it's not a loud snap. It's a silent, you know, closure. I guess would be a better way of. It's kind of like yeah, a it. pin, a pin, and a sliding over mechanism. It's not an actual snap. Yeah, very, very simple and and awesome to use. Awesome to use, and I think that's going to be a a great fe uh, feature going you know forward and and products. I guess from from a development standpoint, so really looking forward to that so that's one of the so f again f just to kind of like from what i helped chris with is we built the first version of that with a zipper in our in, at sitka we brought it to our designer showed him and said we'd want to make this better and work better and that's where richard came in and ma made the version that's very similar to what we have right now we tweaked a little bit with finding that cobra snap that goes on the back that keeps it totally secure Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that thing is one of the... I was here. I don't know if you remember, Jim, last year. I was here with that vest that we had just hacked up and started the first prototype. So, I was actually using this at Jim's last year with the first, like, I mean, just really rough mock together sample. Yeah. And I was using <laughs> it at, at here last year. I do learn. remember that, Chris. And I remember we've done some of the developments like that, a little crude here and there with arms being cut off garments in their earlier days and <laughs> i cut some off this morning <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh yeah so it's it's funny how uh it's a shame to, to damage the nice garments but man in the in the interest of getting where we want to be i remember that very clearly yes yeah yeah no, that's funny watching especially watching chris and eric just do the, their product testing is a very very funny <laughs> i'll be walking around with idea. two yep. different all right let's just cut this up all right <laughs> what do you mean <laughs> i think another thing on that on this one uh is the uh, very important thing to note is the fact of how how much better the fit is now as well the features are fantastic the silence is fantastic but uh, i enjoyed the fit of the previous one it, you know it was very well tailored but i think in hunting it you need a little more room, especially cold weather hunting, and it's a cold weather system. Mm -hmm. But I am very pleased, and a lot of the guys seem pleased with the uh, a little more generous on the fit and uh, user friendly. And especially, Eric, when you talked about dressing in the tree, which you have to when you walk some distance, uh, it's easy to put that that new fanatic jacket yep. on. Yep. Yep. 
And the last thing we did on the bibs too, I'll talk a little bit. It doesn't really matter so much for Jim's um, place, uh, the way that we hunt here. But one of the big complaints that people had was the burr pickup on the old Fanatic, especially on the bibs. Um, so what we, what we did is a lot of people would say, wow, if you could make the Fanatic light material on the front, that would be great. So now if you look at the bibs, the lower leg and then the, the gusset right in the, the cross panel, basically, those are areas that when they pick up bibs, they can be really, or burrs, they can be really noisy and really kind of a hard, um, way to get them, get them off. So now you can easily just flick them off or pluck them off and they won't, they won't be tied into any Berber material. On the old fanatics, I would just like hire, I was telling people, I'd, I'd come home hunting, throw them down on the ground. I've got two young children and I'd pay them five cents a burr <laughs> to pluck them out. And literally they'd be down there like, <laughs> you know, down there with their little plastic bag, plucking burrs off and throwing them into there. And then they'd That's come torture. over. It, they found it. <laughs> It was great for me and great for them. They did it. I don't know how much longer that would have lasted, but uh, if I didn't have come up with this new system, but they're going to be really upset because their profit center is gone. So <laughs> yeah. I've worked them out of a job. I tried that with my kids. They'd want a dollar per burr. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they're a little older though. So. Yeah, that, that's funny. But um, yeah, so that kind of rounds about the the whole fanatic as far as the the jacket and the bib upgrades. Um, so one of the, the big features and one of the things I think Jim will definitely be able to comment on too is the Fanatic pack. So can you kind of, Chris, let's have you start out with kind of where that idea came from and and kind of the, the development of it. Yeah, so uh, it really started with my conversation with, with Jim. Um, you know, he, he uh, is... I mean, he, he has the ultimate quest for silence. I mean, I call him the original silent fanatic. He is, he embodies what, if you want to talk about being trying to be quiet in the woods, that's exactly what Jim talks about. And so he, he had some ideas on what he wanted to see in a pack. So we were here last year and literally I took everything and Jim and I laid it all out on the ground right here in front of us. We had cleared this coffee table away. We were sitting around, we were talking about what we wanted in a really quiet pack, and we needed to get all of these elements inside of this pack. And so we were talking about different textiles. We had some early prototypes in the process. Um, And so Jim and I just sat there and brainstormed what we were looking at. And basically, I was trying to develop a solution that worked for him, as well as a solution that would work out for a lot of um, other hunters in the market. So the Fanatic pack, what we essentially came up with is the Fanatic hoodie is basically a really just technical hoodie. It's got a face mask, it's got flip mitts, but it takes like a standard hoodie fit and makes it a really technical product. Mm -hmm. Well, what we wanted to do is there's a lot of people, if you talk about who want to be really quiet in the woods, they would wear, they would use a, like a Berber uh, or just like a, like a stuff sack, super quiet, hardly anything to it, super non-technical. And what we try to do is take that concept into a very technical uh, pack. And that's, that's essentially what we came up with. Okay. So the Fanatic pack, what, uh, what are some of the specs on that as far as? So it holds about 2,100 cubic inches. Mm -hmm. um, And the, the layout of it is it borrows kind of from our bucket style design in a lot of our packs. They hang on the side of the tree. They're, they're a bucket. Um, but it's the way that we, ne- we develop it. Um, Jim, for example, carries his, if he's going to carry antlers, he nests them in the bottom of his pack and he shoves them down there and then he laces things on top of that. Mm-hmm. So if you go inside of the pack, it's got compartments, it's got two small pockets. Like if you want to access things that you want to get once the pack's hanging on the tree. Um, and then it's got a large slot in the back for maybe like a midi jacket. So you can separate two different garments and stuff your fanatic jacket in there if you want to. Mm -hmm. Um, and really what we wanted to go through when we were discussing this is what's the order of operations. So you get to the tree, right? Or you're packing up in, 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 wherever you're going out to go for your hunt, but what's the steps you're going to take when you get to the tree. Mm -hmm. So you're going to climb, you're going to maybe use your linemen. If you're, if you're doing a, if you've got sticks already, or if you're setting your own stand and Jim can talk a lot about this in a little bit about how 
you know, the hang and hunt method we have here. There's bolts in the tree and you hang your stand every single time you go up and you break it down every time. Mm -hmm. But we, what we wanted to do is go through the order. So the idea behind this is you walk up to the tree, you throw your linemans up, you climb up, you take out a screw hook from a pocket, you screw that in, uh, you hang the pack on that, your bow's attached to the pack. Then on the outside of the pack is accessible for your bow arm. So you can reach over there, grab that, screw in your bow arm, take the bow off the pack. And then now you're starting to go through the system of pulling the units, the, the elements out you need, going in the order that you're going to need. Maybe you're going to need gloves. You're going to need to be setting out your range finder. And all of the pockets are designed in a certain way. Because one of the things when Jim and I were discussing this is most people are going to hang their pack on their right side. And so the two small pockets, for example, uh, that are on the outside are available to the end user from that side. Mm -hmm. And then the long pocket for a water bottle and your bow arm are on the far side because you're probably not going to need to access those as much. Um, and then there's no plastic parts that are exposed anywhere on the pack to make noise. So there's no like clicking buckles. We use what's called our silent secure hooks. So they're kind of like a molly system. They slide up in and every little closure you see will not have a plastic part to it. And if it, any plastic parts that are absolutely required uh, are hidden, they can go inside of a recessed fabric port so they can't hit anything. So we basically took anything that could possibly make noise on this pack off mm -hmm. and made it all 100% quiet. We sacrificed everything for silence. Well, it was funny when, uh, when you sent me the pack to look, look over it, I was like, where are the buckles at? You know, I was looking <laughs> at, I was like, this doesn't make sense, you know? And then once I started looking into it and I was like, this is a slick system. And now that we've used it this whole week, it's very impressive. And how, when you have something organized, which I credit a lot of that to Jim with his, you know, program here and making sure take nothing that you don't need. No, simplify it and, and make sure you have everything organized. And it's been very simple to use to get in the stand, very efficient, the way things are laid out. And Jim, do you kind of want to talk a little bit about what your thoughts are with this this pack is this everything that you kind of wanted or what are you well, thinking well yeah absolutely Bo I mean it's very exciting for us on this one I think I don't think Chris could have said it any better I mean we were trying to satisfy a need that was that it was a combination of of technical versus practicality and we've seen it so many times and in our years in the field here is someone will come up with a new pack that they'll think this is great or that's great but ultimately once the pack is created and it makes noise, it becomes impractical and useless. So there's so many times we've seen packs come up that have never had any use in the field. And we've eliminated them from being in the field because it's so critical up here. So the thing that's so exciting, up, uh, exciting for us is on this Fanatic pack, if you physically take that pack, you can't make noise with it, first and foremost. So that, that's the exciting part for us as far as the practicality, what it'll do for us. It's laid out in such a way that depending on what type of bow hunter you are, whether you're a guy that walks a distance, which I have to do on many times in several occasions, if I can pack a bow if I want to, uh, I can pack a jacket if I want to. It's got room for my antlers. It's got room for my gear and it's a well-made pack. It's strong. So it lets me be much more versatile in the whitetail game and first and foremost for me it's all about stealth mm -hmm. and that's what this this pack facilitates for what we do another thing in this pack too is it's it's designed with an unstructured design on purpose so the whole idea is you're going to go in with typically especially in cold environments with a pretty full pack but by the time you come out if you take the minimalist approach only bringing what you need that pack should almost be empty when it's sitting on the side of the tree. So the idea is this thing caves in on itself and basically becomes nothing on the side of the tree. And that's intentionally. Uh, and then even the, 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 the little bit of structure that there is in the back of the pack, we went through a bunch of different types of actually padding that were inside of there. So I got a bunch of samples and they would, they would come in and I'd be rubbing them. I'd be like, this is too freaking noisy. Yeah. And, and we like, I'd cut it apart. So I'd get this pack and I'd rip it open. I'd be like, this isn't, this is not what we asked for. And we went through, that was actually one of the toughest things is just getting that little bit of structure 
to quit making noise. Uh, and, and that was, that was intentionally, we, we went through that looking for the right type of, of support inside of there that did not make noise. Yeah. Well, that, that's the one thing I was going to comment on Chris is, it, is it's a pack that lacks structure, which is a beautiful thing. It's got some structure to it, but in, in the minimalist approach that we have, it has enough structure for the serious whitetail fanatic. Um, yet it collapses so it can disappear against the tree for the most part. And that's, uh, that's super, that's very, very important for, for our game. And and the other thing that's super impressive with it being such an unstructured pack, I, I was, uh, skeptical on how it would carry a bow or, or rifle or whatever, muzzleload or whatever it may be. And once you showed me how to rig that up on the back of the pack, it's a very secure system. And, we're climbing the trees every single morning, every single evening with that on our pack and actually, you know, throwing it in with here up at gyms, we're having it in the back of the side by side. It's bouncing around as you get out, you grab your bow right from your, um, from your grip, pick up the whole pack. Everything stays together. doesn't rattle, doesn't make any noise, throw it on your back, go right up the tree. And for an unstructured pack, it's extremely impressive how it does how it is able to carry your your weapon i guess yeah the key on that is the there's the wing compression straps that we developed they're like kind of two wings that come over the front and then the the key on that is out of the top is a out of a port comes a basically a stabilization strap that comes around with a silent hook and you've just basically got to wedge that bow and tilt it back away because a lot of times when you just attach a bow it wants to fall away from you on the back of the pack yeah and then this one allows you to um, to basically tilt it back towards your head uh, using that uh, stabilization strap. And the whole idea is I want you to be able to get out, walk to your stand, not have to set anything on the ground. I want you to be able to walk up that tree, climb that tree with your pack on your back, your bow on your back, and not have to pull anything back up into the tree with you later on. You should just be able to walk up the tree, go up, get set up, and go minimize the amount of time you're taking to get ready yeah so that's the whole idea and if you're setting a tree stand jim's got a great system hook it on the side of your hip climb the tree and then set your stand yeah. and that's the best way to go about it and you can you can do that really quiet the thing is you just have to practice yeah a lot of people just expect to just be able to go and do this you actually have to spend time learning how to do yeah. this quietly and if you come up to gyms and you don't practice ahead of time you're uh you don't get to you go don't go out. to go hunt until you're t- it's time. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard something about that. I don't know what that is. Yeah, I don't yeah. know who's making up this kind of stuff. But Jim, if uh, um, feel free to add anything else you want. And if not, I know you have to to run here. But um, yeah, I was just going to say that uh, further to Chris's comment. I mean, we're always trying to run this this stealthy system, and this pack just really helps us. And Chris touched on that: the ability to walk up to a walk up to a. Uh, uh, a stand site, have a safety harness with a lineman, get up that, get up that stand site, install a stand. And that pack just makes it so much easier. Mm-hmm. It, uh, getting up, getting in place, being stealthy and doing so, and then ultimately being organized in a tree stand, the way the pack's designed. It's very, very specifically designed for the tree stand, the white tail tree stand bow hunter. Yeah. And then of course the silence, which is what it's all about. Yep. You're getting a thumbs up here from uh, your brother. So uh, if you need to get going here, Jim, I really appreciate you coming on to talk about uh, some of these items here. It is that time of year, the out- outfitting calls. So I appreciate the opportunity, gentlemen, to be in on this bowl. Yeah. Thanks for the invite. Yeah, I yeah, appreciate yeah. it. So um, if you have, want to just pass off the mic to uh, Adam Jordison here. So Absolutely. Okay, awesome. gentlemen. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Jim. So, Bo, why don't you take, I mean, this is your first time experiencing some of this stuff. Uh, I think it would be good to get just your perspective because you came in new to this and and hadn't used any of this before. I mean, what's what's been a couple of the the things from your standpoint as as somebody experienced the system for the first time? So, yeah, so we already talked about the, the sound thing, and I'm not going to dive into that any any more detail. But one of the biggest things that I noticed is, so this morning, it was somewhere around zero degrees with wind chill, probably in the negatives. 
so I was layering up a little bit, you know, and, and I had, um, a decent amount. I had the, so I had the heavyweight Merino top on with a fanatic hoodie and or not the fanatic hoodie, excuse me. I replaced that out with a Equinox hoodie and then the Celsius midi and then the fanatic jacket. That's a lot of layers. And with that new, with the, in the right elbow for the right-handed version with it, you being able to articulate a little bit better. I was able to draw my bow like I was still in just wearing the Fanatic hoodie. You know, it was very convenient and without making a lot of motion, it wasn't, um, it doesn't make it as difficult to, to shoot, shoot in cold weather gear anymore yeah. where that's always been, you know, an issue, which you always should shoot in the gear that, that you're going to be hunting in, but it didn't throw me off. Like, you know, some other stuff maybe, or make it difficult to draw from any angle you can draw with that. And that was a big deal for me to be able to do that. You know, whenever you're in close quarters and something happens, you may need to draw a little bit of an awkward angle and there was no binding or anything of the, the fabrics with that. Yeah, and that's one of the things I didn't touch on earlier, too, is um, this new Fanatic is actually 23% warmer than the old Fanatic. Uh, that's uh, something we've, we've shown in the, the Comfort Lab as well. Um, so if you take the jacket apples to apples uh, and compare to them, uh, that, that warmth ratio is, is, is 23% warmer. If you take the recommended base layers, which I say is like a core lightweight and a core heavyweight, that's typically what I was, uh, am wearing. Uh, it's about 15% warmer because those are going to add some clo value or some insulating value themselves. Mm -hmm. Um, but for example, last year we didn't get down. We maybe got down the lowest was like four degrees, uh, here that we, we got to Fahrenheit mm -hmm. last year like the coldest day I hunted was negative 15 degrees and that is exceptionally cold. I mean, so much that if you looked at my site, it was like crystallizing like a spider web <laughs> and like my, you know, my rest had like, it was growing like crystals off of it. My whole bow, everything just started to like get just snow crystals all over it. It was extraordinarily cold that day and yeah, that's that picture those pictures you sent me yeah when, when, when you're preparing me to come up here this is what you're gonna look at look like i'm like oh geez <laughs> was, it, was it foggy or were you by the river no i wasn't by the river i was actually up in that uh kind of in the pasture up there oh, wow. where i was today so Dang. yeah yeah but it was it was a really uh but I, the the snow fog kind of set yeah. in that day and yeah it just started building up on everything yeah no that's and that's i was pretty funny. warm except for my feet so yeah, and uh, we went down a bunch of different rabbit holes with boots this <laughs> yeah <laughs> over this uh, trip too. But yeah, if you if you can keep your feet and hands warm, you've been good all all across the board. The only thing we need is some sort of face mask that doesn't cover your ears so you can still hear. That's wind stopper on just the side that the wind's blowing on. Because right now <laughs> the right side of my face is wind burnt. But other than that, <laughs> that's, you know, that's I've been more the constant challenge. Yeah. Yeah. So other than that, and not looking like you know something out of a movie, and you can't shoot anyways. I think uh, I think the gear's done pretty well for the temperatures that that we've had. And like I said, I keep just switching out base layers, switching out insulating layers, trying to see what you know what what works and, and kind of what the comfort levels are. I haven't, uh, haven't grown a set yet to be able to just throw on the fanatic vest and see what my lower levels of temperature is with that. But, uh, I think with some of the other layering pieces you could get, I think tomorrow is yeah. actually going to be a good vest day. Is it? Yeah. It's going to be warmer in the afternoon, just above freezing. So, Oh really? It's yeah. Up that warm. Yep. Yep. After the rain sets in. So there's supposed to go to snow rain to a little, little, yeah, snow all morning, a little bit of drizzle right around lunch. And then at two o'clock, right before we go out, should end. So oh, it'll yeah. be a nice bet. Do I have a challenge? I think I'm going to have to kill yeah. in the morning, I think. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I think. <laughs> That's a good idea. Yeah. Except for Eric's flying out. So. Yeah. Maybe we'll, have you it, well, usually when I leave, people start shooting stuff. So, <laughs> well, what are you doing here <laughs> <laughs> on the road? I'm just kidding. Get well, out! I think this is a good time to announce Adam, Adam Jordison. Did I pronounce that correctly? Yep, yep. You got it. awesome. So Adam is a Sika Whitetail Ambassador here, who's gotten to 
test out this new Fanatic gear and everything. So, Adam, do you kind of want to introduce yourself, where are you from, and a little bit there? Yeah, I'm from Iowa and, uh, you know, land of the Giants, so to speak, on, on whitetail deer. And, you know, we take whitetail hunting pretty serious there in the Midwest. And, you know, our, we're pretty fortunate with, you know, our contribution, which is I would consider a very small footprint in the uh, – the line of how Sika products get developed, but you know our goal is to get that stuff out in the field and put it through proper testing, you know, towards the proper species, and you know give give feedback, you know, and I I think I don't think you can ask for uh, a better gig, you know what I mean, when you get to have products coming from Sika and they say hey just test this out and tell us what you think, and then you know you get to actually go wear it out in the woods, which obviously helps you in in the field, so yeah. Yeah, we're pretty honored to to be able to do that. It's a small group of us, you know, through the Midwest and, you know, even actually down south. And, um, yeah, I think I think the variation in, in the the type of deer and type of weather. Um, yeah, you guys get some cold weather in Iowa as as it gets on later we can, in the season, right? You know, and I think the key thing that Chris has always mentioned about Joe's or Je- um, Jim's place, Jim's place, sorry, is that you know you get to be in cold weather a lot sooner. You know, right now, right now at home, I think it's, you know, still above 30. Yeah. You know, you're not going to catch yourself, you know, in the freezing temperatures that we're looking at here. So, yeah, it gets cold, but not that vest. Bad. What's that? You can use your fanatic vest. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's funny because I just, I just thought about this as we're talking about, I'm like, it's getting above freezing. Like, yeah. <laughs> and, and like at home last week, I was trying to get it to that temperature and yeah. I'd be pulling out the fanatic stuff. Now I'm like, Hey, let's yeah. shed layers, you know, yeah. it's, it's kind of <laughs> disappointing. Cause you expect like, I was actually like with the low, like every temperature really has been, I don't know, high, maybe on the highest end in the mid low twenties. Yeah. Maybe. And the low ends around four, I think here, mm-hmm. which and that's pretty typical here. Like the fact that it's getting above freezing tomorrow is is crazy. That'll be the first day that it's going to get that warm. But uh, I mean, yeah, you can expect when you're here anything from negative twenty to maybe thirty five degrees. That's the range you have to prepare for if you come to the bow zone. Yeah. In well, and I think in Iowa too. I mean, it's important that it's we're not just isolating ourselves to be bow hunters you know we do obviously think that that's probably the majority of people that are going to want to use this but you know in case even in iowa when we're getting those temperatures when it's going to be that silent you're looking at muzzleloader you're looking at shotgun Mm -hmm. and so you know the pack's going to be versatile and just even that especially yeah that's uh, that's top of mind because we're here in the bow zone but a lot of the stuff i was doing is thinking about those muzzleloader or even rifle seasons so Part of it, the reason that area and the elbow is is for if you're shooting a rifle, there's no compression. Uh, you can there's a configuration for the pack that I have for carrying a muzzleloader or a rifle. So you should take your optics and there's a port in the side of the wings. You should run your optics through that port in the wings, mm-hmm. and then uh, and then you just compress it just like you would your bow. So it's the same but spot then, you put your. Yep, uh, through your yep. So if you're shooting a bow, you put your stabilizer yeah. through that port. If you're using a uh, something with optics, you put your optics through that port, and then you're gonna take around the compression strap or the stabilization strap. It's gonna go around your barrel and then tilt your barrel up straighter up into the air. So when you're okay. carrying that, yeah, I've run the configuration last year for a couple of muzzleloader hunts. I did another thing too is for the. The, if you put the antlers on the outside of the pack, they nest inside of those wing compression straps. But if you run the bases of your antlers, you'll see on the bottom of each of the two pockets on the sides are actually ports. Those are for the bases of the antlers to go into. Oh, so okay. when you nest them, the tines together on your antlers, the bases sit and all, all kind of nest in the back of the pack. So yeah. there's you can either compress a muzzleloader, a rifle, a bow antlers or a jacket in those compression straps depending on so those are all five different configurations you could use that pack for Hmm. yeah so i again yeah i always uh sometimes i get narrow-minded with it because i mostly bow hunt and i always forget that especially with this stuff you know it can be used for a whole bunch of different you know avenues so thanks for bringing that up adam it's uh 
and and again we've used it for such a small i mean i've used those compression straps for specifically just my bow you know this time where you may be able to use it and depending on what you're doing maybe you're carrying your bow in and you're going a little bit longer walk and that's where you're going to put the the bibs on the outside or something you know there's a lot of different uses for it in a you know relatively small package so yeah, I think that's the thing that you and I keep talking about. It's like we're just wildly impressed with how a convenient, silent, but the structure that it just all of a sudden gives that pack. Because yeah. on the outside, you look at it and it's like, what is this thing going to hold? And all of a sudden, you just do two cinches and the thing is now, you know, holding absolutely everything that you can think of. Yeah. Yeah. And part of the reason Adam's here, too, just so everybody knows, is we had a prototype bib last year so i sent it to jim for a while he wore it and then he immediately overnighted it to adam and he used it in iowa uh the same pair of bibs to give input so but i had like eight or nine bibs and jacket systems going around to our ambassadors and they were shipping around to different people Mm -hmm. and so i got a really balanced set of opinions and i could look for common threads of things that i needed to adjust uh to to, to make the, the system better. So that's, uh, you know, Adam was really a, a, a very important part of the, the team that was giving that input and, you know, having him come here and actually get yeah. to use and see the results of his input is, is I think, really nice. Well, that, that's been surreal for me. Um, but I think the thing that's been the most humbling and eye-opening is actually hearing from you and Eric and seeing the amount of work that's went into the science and the production of, of this stuff, it actually makes me feel like, um, cause when we, when we speak about things to change and things to do, we really do not think about what it would take to do that. You yeah. know what I mean? And so like, you know, let's just the burrs, like let's get the burr thing situated. Like that was a big deal for us, but we had no idea how much that would complicate their lives until yeah. I started seeing the spreadsheets and seeing the PDFs of what they're doing. It's, I think the guys need to uh, appreciate it a little more if they don't, because it is absolutely intense. And and when these two, like I said last night, when these two collided, Jim and now the, the production, both Chris and Eric, you have both people that are just extremely passionate about their side of things when it clashes you know you do get a a product like this that is just outstanding so yeah again i feel like we have a small footprint in what you guys are doing but it it is actually pretty cool to see what you guys take an idea to and then it goes to there and then it goes to there well that's that's what's great you know and um about the company i've noticed that for a while now i've been you know wearing sicka since 2013 and you know as a dealer for a while and everything else is being able to notice that the team does listen and really wants to find solutions to things so it's not you know when when people have feedback it's something that's brought up and and it may take two three four years to develop something like that because you want to make sure that when that product is released to the public that all the flaws are ironed out and everything is is ready to go and that's that's pretty neat to to be able to see you know yeah and i mean i even work with you on some stuff i know you you know you can't talk about but i mean i take the one thing from my perspective is having people with balanced sets of opinions from different regions because the way that Adam's going to do stuff in Iowa and the way you're going to do stuff in Pennsylvania and where Jim does stuff here and I'm, I'm from the South. Yeah. So, you know, for how I have biases that are actually ingrained in my perspective and the way I was raised hunting and having a really balanced set of individuals to come and, and give their perspective and, and their opinion all I'm doing is looking for common threads uh, with that feedback and then the few golden nuggets that may be just on their their own. Yeah. For example, like we have a guy named John Mulligan who's on our ambassador team. He also is at Wicked Tree Saws, but he he's a lefty. So he's got the lefty jacket, but he's like, our, I mean, that's he's a perfect example of why you'd want a jacket designed for a left-handed user. And I, I don't know any other company maybe there's one out there that would make a lefty jacket, but that's what we'll do. We'll make a jacket for left hand. Yeah. Cause we want the gear to work the right way for how people hunt. 
I can I can picture a few people I know that are going to be super excited about that. They always get mad. No one has anything for left-handers, you know, that type of thing. So, look, Sitka's out here trying to do something for you lefties that are, you know, a little awkward, but that's – that's the way that it is. <laughs> and I'm uh, sure they got to deal with a lot of There could be lefties in the room you're offending, so just be careful. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. Oh, we got a left right back there. <laughs> awesome. I saw raise his hand when we first earlier, were talking yeah. about the lefty well, jacket. Well, that helps. Now yeah. I can send Ross a jacket. <laughs> Man, jeez. <laughs> I know what to send him now. <laughs> That's funny. But but anyways, yeah, and, and like and, and again we won't talk about any detail, but you know, the thing that you and I were working on there, that's something that's slated for twenty twenty or beyond. I don't know that you were telling me and I'm like, that's awesome. You yeah, know, that's a long way out. So maybe even twenty one if we don't get it right. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Already pushed it one year. <laughs> yeah. So you, Yeah, we're almost done with twenty twenty, so yeah, exactly. So the, the just just that that thought process there showing that it takes a long time to come up with it. And and Chris, what you brought up was a good point is, you know, Adam and I's style of hunting is probably and we've kind of figured is hundred and ten percent different because we're hunting in such different environments and, you know, conditions, but there's always things that are, you know, the same that we do, but a little bit of different tweaking. So getting everyone's opinion definitely you know, helps. And I'm sure that definitely makes it tough on your side of things. Cause you know, there, you get people like me that I, I have a strong mind. I think of something this way or way more than me, Jim, as far as, you know, this is, you know, the way things should be. And I'm sure you got crazy ideas coming in you're like, are you, is this guy drunk? I mean, what is he thinking? You know, yeah. you have to, I think you have to sort all through. the time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's typically they're like, what are you doing? Well, we actually have a tree stand in the office so, like, right outside my cube is, like, Sika put in a pole, and we have, like, a lone wolf attached to that. And so, sometimes people will walk into the dark, we call it the dark room, because it's kind of like a dungeon where the product development area is, and there's, like, frosted out windows, nobody can see in from yeah, the outside. You see Eric back in the corner. Yeah, and they'll be in the corner, but, <laughs> and then people will come in, and I'll be, like, up in the Take tree stand, back. like, doing something, like, interacting with product, and they're like, seriously? I'll be like... It's perfect. It's right outside my cube. I can, yeah. I can, uh, I can climb up in the tree stand. So <laughs> I'll sit up there in the office sometime. Oh, that's funny. Um, so we kind of covered here. We've went through, you know, the pack. We went through the jacket and the bibs. Um, there is also a vest and and the fanatic hoodie as well. Is there any changes to the vest and the hoodie? Uh, th- there is a uh, new hoodie coming out. It's come out with a new textile this year. So the fanatic uh, hoodie will come out. I guess that'll be fall of 19 when everyone can actually get their hands on it. You guys get them? No, I've never, okay. I haven't seen them yet. I've been wearing it this trip. Yeah. I'd, I'll have to check it out because I'd you. like the old one. So hopefully you didn't mess it up. It's it's really nothing. <laughs> yeah, it's same. just a textile change. Yeah, okay. um, some of the pe- peeling. Uh, so sometimes it would fuzz up a little bit. And this one uh, is, is much better at that. So it's a new, t- it's just basically large. Everything else is the same. I'll leave it with you. Okay. Awesome. I'd love to try that out. Thanks. Chris, you're a 2X, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I would like to see you get in my media. <laughs> nah, I'm good. I'll wait until 2019. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. So, okay. So the Fanatic hoodie has a little bit of a different textile to make it, I guess, is it more durable or just not fuzzing up basically? Yeah, it's, there's a, it's a little bit more durable than, than the old one. Uh, it also uh, moves moisture a little bit better. So we have some information. There's actually a whole base layer reset inside the Sika line. Um, and a lot of that has to do with better moisture management. So like the lightweight synthetic, for example, is, is way more uh, uh, improved at moving moisture away from the body. The midweight is actually more of a true midweight. And the lightweight's even a lighter weight than it was before. So that's those are some real big changes to um, the oh. syn- to the synthetic program as our base layer program. Interesting. Okay, yeah. Cool. So I just got like a text this yesterday from Mike Herbs, who's one of our ambassadors, and yeah, he, I gave him my set of uh, of uh, um, of the fanatic hoodies, and and he's like, oh, I love this, and it's not you know it's not having these problems. So. He, you know, that's another way we're using some of our ambassadors to field test the product. Cool. 
I can show you the textiles for the heavy and the light. I don't think I have any mid here when we go downstairs. Okay. Yeah, I'd love to check it out because I've used the core lightweight for everything. And then the Fanatic hoodie has been kind of the staple piece. Yeah. You know, that's that's what I call the, the gateway drug with Sika yeah. for anything that when, when people come and look at it and be like, listen. If you could buy one thing right now, I'd recommend looking at this. Just to let you know that your wallet's going to open up more as you go down <laughs> once you get into this gateway, you know, pieces as it would be. And uh, so, yeah, I'd, I'll be interested. Another to check cool that thing out. with the Fanatic hoodie is uh, we've always printed the hood, or we haven't always printed the hood, but we've been able to as we've you know developed the technology to do it. This year, the fabric and the manufacturer agreed to print. We're still printing both sides, but both sides are printed in camo. So if your hood flips inside out, it's going to be not gray anymore. It's going to be... Uh, okay. That's oh, awesome. if it's open country, it'd be open country. If it's EV2, it'd be... Out. Mm -hmm. Well, for him, since it's a fanatic hoodie, it's elevated too. Okay. Yeah. Yep, and also the face mask is uh, a more breathable textile. So you used to put the face mask on and, you know, you could just feel some air restriction. The new face mask textile actually ha allows air flow through it a, a lot better. It's more like the Apex um, textile. Oh, okay. Not quite awesome. as, it's not quite as meshy, but it's kind of meshy. Is it similar to like the Equinox hoodie, the way that one is, or a little bit different with the face yeah. mask? Okay. It's Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a new textile that we haven't used before. Interesting. Okay. Um, and th this isn't exactly whitetail related, but you were saying about the printed on the inside of the, like so all of the, all of the hoods for all the sick and new base layers will have okay. for heavyweight and midweight will be camo inside. Is there going to be a subalpine fanatic hoodie? You just named. No, 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 but there'll be a subalpine heavy hoodie. Gotcha. So the it doesn't hoodie. have the flip fence. Um, so it's got a few different features that maybe, um, wouldn't be right. That wouldn't be right in the big game category that's why there's a different product for that so like we said fit for use but this is a perfect example i was using my fanatic hoodie this morning and like i was i had the old one on mm -hmm. and i was like because they don't have we didn't get the samples in my size but the uh, i'm flipping the hood making sure so i didn't have a giant gray patch behind my head because yeah. i am like everything's got to be optifated on me like i'm i go to painstaking levels to make sure that I've got concealment. Like I'll hide as soon as I see a deer coming at that face mask is coming up really quickly because they peg your face. You like, just got to grow a mustache. You'd be good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah no, I can I, well, I could probably grow it fast, but my, like I said, my, I came out right before this trip cause I had a beard beforehand and my wife looked at me and she just pointed <laughs> back into the bathroom and shaved up stash right now. Ain't worth it. I was like, because I, I just walked out and I was like, hey, babe, you like my rut stash? She just looked at me and pointed at the bathroom and said, go back. <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't let it soak in long enough. She would have been okay with it after a little while. I'm sure of it. <laughs> right? Co yeah, coming yeah. from me. I think you're the <laughs> only person to pull it off, though. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know about that, but... I've seen more of those Burt Reynolds stashes lately. It's it's a thing. I know. And it's not just haunted. It's an epidemic. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's an <laughs> epidemic. I think it's a tribute to Burt Reynolds. How does this always get turned around back onto me? I started it, I guess, but anyways, it is good for concealment. But <laughs> it's so, the red yeah, stash. Yeah. It's the red stash. <laughs> yeah. It's almost as good as a double printed hood. <laughs> yes, almost as good. But so with with the double printed hood, as we were kind of getting into that a little bit here um, on the Fanatic hoodie, is there anything else with the Fanatic hoodie that's kind of a new feature? Or I think the ma the mask, the print, uh, we've gotten rid of some of the areas where there was mid weight, and it's now truly a, just a warm, warm piece. Okay, cool. But the construction is going to be very similar as before. It's mainly a textile update to make the face mask better, to make it uh, a little bit more durable um, from a, from a pilling standpoint and a better concealment options. So those are those are the three main changes. But if you like the old Fanatic hoodie, then you're going to love the new one. I've been okay. wearing it all week, and it's. I mean, I've I've worn the that textile for a while since we've been developing it. But the the hoodie itself, like, just it feels great. It, it's soft, it's warm, it's comfortable, it stretches great. You know, I had it on and on, I, I wore it over my uh, Celsius uh, midi just because that's how I like to do it and it stretches over that fine. Oh, really? Yeah. Huh. Interesting. You're a freak show. I just like how it, it helps keep I it quiet. I did notice that. I was like, yeah. what's a, 
puffy looking fanatic who you think I just he's like it there. keeps everything else quiet. Wow. Wow. Look at Eric creating his own system. Yeah, I think I had six layers on today. <laughs> just a couple test layers and <laughs> and, and I would still be able to draw my bow and shoot stuff, so <laughs> what'd you shoot? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> the shit. <laughs> <laughs> Shot the dough outside here. Or yeah. buck, whatever that that the three D target. The, yeah. yeah, the three D <laughs> target. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> shoot stuff. Yeah, stuff. I can shoot stuff. Yeah. Not yeah. off. Poor poor Eric shows up on our first set too and sees uh one seventy oh. drop time with a twelve inch drop uh that that I I think I saw last year and got away. I and then Bo comes in and sees a two hundred inch deer probably. <laughs> At, at 35? 35, yeah. 35 yards, yeah. And he's, he winded you, right? Yeah, yeah, he did. Well, I, He had an open lane before that, but there was a branch that kind of saved his life there as far as there was, there was, it was, it was kind of a split branch that went across his vital area there, and I was waiting for him to hit the next opening. And at that point, my wind was flowing right to him. But I was optimistic because the doe he was following went through there and never winded me. So I was like, wow, I'm, I might get away with this. But no, no he's too he hit that it. point and you just saw, I, I, I would make a gesture, but you can't see it since we're listening to it. But he looked around the tree and, you know, he, he knew something wasn't right and took off. So, yeah, Eric and I had some really heartbreaks right off the bat. And we've all know? been chasing it since. Yeah, yeah. yeah. chasing that, that heartbreak, nice you know. nice porky today and. Nice, a little six and a little eight. <laughs> so the thing about gems is if you want to come here and see a lot of deer, you're probably not, if you think you're going to come here and, and see a lot of deer, this, like I said, it's, you're chasing the unicorn is like, but I, but like what would pick. you rather have? Would you have rather had night one, you see a 200 inch deer or would you, and, and just get kind of let down throughout the week? Or would you rather like work your ass off like you are? And then the 180 to 200 comes in at the last day. That's actually a proven. Uh, it's better uh, to finish on a finish high note it? than it's to start on a high note. I'd rather. But you guys did help get us through the week because all exactly. I've seen is a passing exactly. glimpse of this mediocre ten point. You know, at like sixty five yards. So, and uh, for, for me, it's nice to know that those were out yeah, there, and like that is, yeah. you know, I'm well, even happier that Eric's leaving because that leaves <laughs> me that drop time that got away from me uh, last I year. Hope you, I hope you do get them. Yeah, you just need to. You need since you have permission to grunt. You can grunt at him now, and I didn't have my. Way. I haven't used any of my grunts yet, so I'm, I, I, I think today. I'm up. To <laughs> I was out there, grunt, grunt, grunt. I was grunting all day, <laughs> seeing what I could get. Use all my grunts up before gym. Oh, before yeah. I leave gyms, <laughs> I've none left over for next year. <laughs> He's actually going to take some from you next year, <laughs> <laughs> which means like days of sitting in the cabin. You won't hear any of this, Willie. Yeah, I'm going to tell him. <laughs> not till January. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Not till January. Uh, but, um, yeah, so we, we started off on a high note there. and But I, I'm pretty sure, well, by the time this, this podcast releases, the results will be out. But yeah. I'm pretty sure tomorrow's the day. Yeah. You know, I, I, rain and snow, sleep. I, I will. It's the first day we've chance. said that, right? Yeah. 100%, yeah. Chance. Yeah, 100%, 100% chance. 100% chance. I haven't said that at all. For the last every day, 50 days. every day, Bo has been saying, "This is my last sit." And we're like, "Oh man, you're leaving?" <laughs> he's like, "No, I'm gonna shoot one tonight." Yeah, every he's like, "100 percent chance, 100 percent chance." There's a 100 percent chance with me gone, you'll have a 100 percent chance of shooting. Something. There's a 100 percent chance we won't find piss bottles everywhere throughout the timber <laughs> now that you're gone. <laughs> I just keep leaving them all over the place <laughs> with, the, with the caps open. Caps oh, open. oh, sabotage. Man. Oh, it's been fun. It's going to be even funner with Eric gone, but. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Be down in Mexico. Good luck, fellas. Yeah, well, thank I'll you. I'll be rooting for you. Last last piece of the Fanatic system was the vest. Is there any changes to that? Uh, uh, it's now got the grunt tube holder on it. Um, again, uh, the, the design of that uh, is it's got a little bit wider neck collar, too, so uh, it fits over mid layers a lot better. Um, and, uh, other than that, the fanatic vest is pretty true to what it was before. It's got a few added features. It's got the constant connect safety harness port, um, and some burr resistant textile along the hem line, yeah. which were jackets that are tip typically pick up burrs. So, uh, that's the main changes to that. Uh, again, it's again, the quieter construction too, as well. 
I don't think you brought up for the jacket or the vest that had the inside the muff pockets. Got oh them. yeah, I didn't realize. I wow, thank you. Yeah, you add cool. value. <laughs> um, does he really? Just though? a little he bit. Does. Okay. He does actually. Hey, he if, actually if, he's the one that got that right because I wanted it a different way <laughs> and he wouldn't listen to me. That's awesome. And then he finally got that one done. And I was like, ah, I like it. Okay, let's keep it. So, um, but inside of the muffs Sometimes now. Sometimes I have a good idea. Yeah. Well, you know, every time a, a, a squirrel yeah, finds a Yeah, there's a black squirrel finds a nut, and you did it. Um, so, uh, he he added, what we added in there is, uh, last year what was happening is my chemical hand warmers would go in the, the hand muff. And I'd pull my hand out, and I'd sling the, the, hand, the chemical hand warmer. Yeah, like, here, dear. Out. Yeah. <laughs> Like out on, and I'd watch it fall into a foot of snow and I'd be like, ah, that's no good. And then you know how it is. Your digits can still get cold when you're having, you know, you want to back on the heat really fast. Yeah. And so what we built inside of there is there's that you'll fill a little bit of like a, a mesh storage pocket and you can throw a chemical hand warmer or you can throw a phone in there too as well with it. Um, and it keeps it all nice and, and warm and it keeps you from throwing those chemical hand warmers out. I was going to tell you, so yesterday I had... In, in the rush, I put the hand warmers in the zip part and plus my phone. And when I took my phone out, it's like, yeah, I had to wait an X amount of time for the phone to, to turn down its heat. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so you I'm, overheated your I phone? I overheated it. It's like it's in your windshield or something. <laughs> wow. So, so even just that divider, it's like, obviously, that's going to be helpful in, in that situation because nine times out of ten, I'm going to have my phone at where that muff is yeah. so I can pull it in, pull it out. And that divider would obviously never heated up my phone the way that one zip pocket did. Yeah, those hand warmers. I get really hot. They're a guys. must, especially when you're climbing the metal bolts that we have it's in terrible. all the trees here. What, what happens when especially, you put the, the chemical toe warmers on your liner sock? <laughs> That's a bad idea. So one of the things we always do is try and test new systems. So I took a chemical toe warmer and I put it you know, in a different layering system, I thought, hey, let's try this. And I threw it on my sock liner and then put my wool socks on top of that. And I was climbing the bolts up there and I told Bo, I was like, I almost wanted to scream out, my feet are on fire. My feet are on fire. It, literally, I was hobbling around yesterday because the bottom of my feet were all burned out. So, oh, Well, you're saying that, and at the same time that your feet are on fire, I'm in the stand and I'm sweating <laughs> because Eric told me to put the toe warmers on the top and bottom of my foot, and, <laughs> and my feet were so hot and sweating that I was literally sitting in the stand. It's like eight degrees out, and I've got tears like coming down my face because my feet were on fire yeah i i, I just put them uh one on the bottom today not the top <laughs> yeah, well, you, you told me about it like i know. doing it for years no i just thought it was a good idea <laughs> <laughs> there's a product it's a great product, idea. yeah yeah that's right we we always try i mean there's try some things i mean you never know it's not going to work out it's like the system i came back and i was like eric what do you think of the system he was like yeah i was like i hated that system it was the worst experience yeah so. and your feet are burned yeah you're literally your feet are burned and and blistering <laughs> <laughs> like why are you limping yes. I'm like, oh, i think i got <laughs> blisters from my boots i'm like how did that how did get blisters <laughs> we walked five top, feet top <laughs> yeah I've, I've taken a total of like 28 steps all week and that that was up the stairs here yeah. you know <laughs> no that's funny. yeah but i probably sweated it just as much as like a marathon <laughs> trying to be silent climbing the climbing tree. a tree big ass dude going up a tree <laughs> <laughs> just stressed out because you're trying stress. to be silent. Like, I feel like Jim's back there with the whip. <laughs> well, I remember the first time I did it last year. I got up into the. I got. Up, I was got up to the top, and I was literally pouring sweat because I was doing everything <laughs> wrong. <laughs> and then you figure out real quickly how to solve things. And now I can get up there, no problem at all, no exertion or anything. But oh. I remember last year. I was sitting out there, and Jim put me in that stand that you could see from the lodge, yeah. so he could watch me with a spot and scope to make sure that I passed the test that I could go into the real field. That's how he. That's, <laughs> was that, that phase two? Well, we didn't. We skipped phase. You two. guys got by for some reason. I was really upset. I think I nobody think, wound up in. The, I think I got a phase one location. <laughs> Did you? One. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Phase one. I was on. I was damn near like in the dog kennels <laughs> in the gravel road. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are over there 180s 200 yeah. <laughs> I'm like what kind of shit <laughs> oh man 
<laughs> That's funny. Uh, it's been fun. It's nice though when you pass the test, he gets you in the. Yeah. By the end of the yeah. week last year, I was like in the betting area. So well, that's, yeah, that's what he told me today. He goes, "You're going into the sanctuary. No one's ever sat there before. Don't mess it up." Yeah. I'm like, "Okay." <laughs> Your feet should never touch the ground. Yeah. Well, we so did I just some, flew from the ranger yeah. and landed on a bolt. We did know? some filming today, and like I think we haven't necessarily been able to see each other's like how quiet are you really oh yeah you know and so today it was kind of cool to see Bo because we were doing some filming stuff um to really see how he does go up there and he's he's a stud he's stealth that's cool ninja yeah yeah i didn't get to watch you but i bet it was pretty you heard me you didn't need to (laughs) (laughs) no it's it's been it's been awesome getting to do it because i mean from the beginning i was pretty rocky with it even though i was practicing at my house i was doing it wrong so like it didn't um help but once you start doing it over and over and over again it just becomes a lot simpler and smoother and everything else so i've learned a lot about different knots and different ways to you know use lineman belts and everything else it's pretty pretty neat to to be able to do that so some that didn't go so well yeah some didn't go so well but (laughs) hey you live and you learn that's that's right (laughs) Again, you almost so. didn't make it down from that tree. I know. I You're got almost still stuck up there. <laughs> yeah, the Prusik knot was a little too tight. I must have leaned back on it. I was stuck, and I was I was like, I'm done. I'm just going to hang here until someone finds me. <laughs> Les, I'm up here. Les doesn't stop, so yeah. if you ain't there, he'll be back tomorrow morning. <laughs> Every half hour, I'll drive back through <laughs> till the end of the night, and you're still hanging there. <laughs> oh, Bo must man. have had something. He wasn't down from his stand. <laughs> it's like three in the morning. He's just hunting the night shift. <laughs> <laughs> oh, awesome so do we have anything else that we want to add on any of the fanatics no we won't or? put your poor listeners through anything else though <laughs> i think that was good i i i enjoyed it i know that so it's amazing that we're laughing that we weren't the first day where we no it was all business yeah and now we can have fun and we, we well, we're laughing best. because you're leaving <laughs> 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 let's remember <Damn> that <laughs> <sighs> right. it's well, fun no, I hope good. I, I hope you guys shoot a deer before I do because I'm going to shoot a f- few down south. So I'm yeah, sure you will. Where you're going? Yeah, on a management hunt. So. Yeah, a management hunt and I, totally different. I could I really sure. use that. I really after, like you guys to shoot yeah. one before me though. So do it. I don't. Yeah. After my experiences in Pennsylvania and now here, I could really use some sort of a management hunt to get my ego, you know, <laughs> built back up. No, it's been my self esteem. Last year was a great year for me. I shot a bunch of stuff this year i'm 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 o for a many <laughs> <laughs> o for a lot o for a lot so yeah i hear you same boat <laughs> but all right guys thank well you. yeah yeah, thank yeah you, thanks for coming yeah, on thanks, here bro. and talking about this and uh enjoyed spending camp with you guys for the the week, I guess. Likewise. Yeah, yeah. Well, yes. It's good to meet you guys. <laughs> I guess that's what I folks guess. say. Right? Except for me, <laughs> except for me, I guess. But whatever. Yeah, Eric, you weren't that bad, I guess. <laughs> oh man! All right. Well, all right. We'll I'm talk coming to, to you Pennsylvania guys then. And torment you there. there you are go. you? <laughs> are you? Look at it. You really are. I'm just kidding. You're welcome anytime. All right, guys. We'll talk to you later. All right, Bo. See you, Bo. Bye. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of East Meets West Hunt with your host, Bo Martonic. For more great content and to stay up to date, visit eastmeetswesthunt.com, Facebook at East Meets West Outdoors, and Instagram at East Meets West Hunt. If you enjoyed today's episode, please review and subscribe, and we'll catch you next time.